Welcome, I'm Michael Baker. Thanks for joining me today as we explore concepts with the objective of improving your management skills and growing your business. Do you have a notepad and a pen handy? I hope you do because I want you to take notes. I want you to make a commitment to yourself that you will jot down some sort of action item that you can implement in your business today. That's what this is all about, implementation to drive your business forward. Do you like magic? I've always liked magic. You know, like uh, illusionists is what I'm talking about here. Do you, like since I was a kid, I've always appreciated magic. I learned a few magic tricks as a kid or like card tricks. And I remember, you know, buying those novelty tricks you could uh, buy at the magic store. And I had a few little books on that. And just throughout my whole life, I've always enjoyed magic. Not everybody does. I think most people do. I've been to Las Vegas ugh, just about 30 times and yet I've never seen a Las Vegas magic show. I have seen professional magic show somewhere else uh, in which a guy uh, was uh, called me up on stage as part of the uh, I as a volunteer from the audience and uh, you know did a few things and it was entertaining. I like to think of myself as being you know very hard to fool and so uh whenever there's a magician I, I there was a restaurant we used to frequent and the magician would come around to the tables afterward and do little tricks and everything and i usually could spot what he was doing or whatever but i i i don't know i'd, I'd like to try to just enjoy the show so this time that i was uh brought up on stage or whatever i was trying to be paying fairly close attention, but I wasn't going to give anything away if I understood what was going on. But I have to admit, I didn't know what was going on uh, sort of for the finale of having me on stage. At least what he did was he lowered a tin can, you know, like, a, you know, like a can of soup kind of thing from the ceiling was lowered down and he took it in his hand. He asked me to inspect it and it appeared to be a regular can. And, he took a can opener and opened it and out of it he took my watch and he said I have a gift for you and he gave me my watch back so somehow throughout the rest of the show he had managed to take my watch and somehow they got it into this can I mean obviously it was a gimmick can a trick can that uh, you could easily put something in but it it those are often the case with with magic tricks recently I've taken, I mean, quite recently, I've taken to watching these magic tricks revealed shows on YouTube. And there's one, I'll put a link in the description to the one I've been watching. They're revealing a lot of the magician secrets off of America's Got Talent and Britain's Got Talent and that kind of thing. And <laughs> I, at one time that was considered sort of taboo. There was seemed to be some collusion amongst the, all the magicians that you would never give away um, any of their secrets or whatever. And then there was that special many years ago where the masked magician would come on stage and he would reveal the greatest uh, magic tricks and everything. Now you can go on YouTube and you can find out the way just about anything is done. And have you noticed when you do that, it's fairly disappointing. You know, when you see the illusion done, you are really excited and you're like, wow, how did they do that? You see the, the shots of the audience and they're, you know, they're, that's exactly what they're mouthing. How did he do that? The, the judges, everybody's looking at one another and it's like, that's mind blowing. And then you see how it's revealed. The, the secret is revealed and it's like, oh, that's not that great. Uh, and it does uh, with all due respect to magicians and illusionists that, you know, there's a great deal of skill involved. Any of the tricks that I bought at the magic uh, shops or whatever, I could never pull them off 100% of the time. Uh, there's a lot of practice involved. And these guys spend their whole lives getting good with how they shuffle their cards and how they can pull off a trick that just if you know the secret doesn't mean you can do it, the whole act. And then there's some, some of them have comedies. I don't know who you would say is the best magician. I'm partial to David Blaine, but some people you know, would say, oh, Harry Houdini and others, maybe like Chris Angel or David Copperfield, Penn and Teller, that show Penn and Teller Fool Us. That, that, that's sort of interesting as well as we kind of enjoy being fooled. That's the entertainment. And certainly if you're a magician, you've been doing this your whole life and you're really savvy to how the tricks are pulled off 
then it'd be very difficult to fool you. And this is what, you know, I started thinking about this when I was watching all these shows about how the magician tricks are revealed, their secrets are revealed. And I was like, why are you enjoying this so much? And I thought that what resonated with me is the psychology behind it. And I think this is really pertinent right now with what, everything that's going on in the world and how it's not always enjoyable to be fooled. Throughout your life, you've had moments where it, it, through entertainment and illusionists and magicians, you've enjoyed where they can fool you and you, you kind of, you're like, how did you do that? How did you do that? But then you're sort of disappointed when you find out and you're almost disappointed in yourself. Like, how did I get fooled by that? That's kind of obvious now that I know how he did it, but it's not obvious while it's going on. Are there things in your life, maybe even in your business and you as a manager where you're being fooled and you think one thing and it's really just an illusion and perhaps the things aren't what they seem to be. And we, we, I think that's what got me so interested in watching, you know, like I say, when I was contemplating, why am I watching all these shows about magic tri tricks revealed? It served as a good analogy for other things in life where we may be fooled or tricked or being lied to and we realize and we can go back and kind of see, oh, well, what are the elements of how this works? And I, and I was, I started contemplating this and throughout life, there's a lot of things. And, and one of the most basic things is, comes down to our premises, those things that we believe, those axioms, those principles. Have you heard of Occam's razor? This is in general, that is the most probable, the most obvious explanation is the probable one. It's probably right. So when you think of something, if you're watching a magician on stage and you make an assumption about something, maybe you're guessing at how he might do it. Well, Occam's razor says that the most obvious explanation is true. And fundamentally, what the most obvious thing that occurs to us is that's not real. We know that as adults. Now, when children go to a magic show, they see something and they're like, wow, that's magic. That coin really did disappear. That rabbit really did appear out of the hat and uh, he was not there before. But as adults, we go, wow, that, that was really good how they pulled that off. I don't know how they do it, but I know it's an illusion. I know it's not real. Although <laughs> there are some people who think uh, some of the magic tricks are real. Have you seen these uh, street magic with David Blaine and uh, some of the people are like, you know, they start to get afraid or they're like, wow, you're, you know, you are satanic or you are evil or whatever. You are out outer worldly. It's just unbelievable because he's so gifted at being able to pull off the illusion where people can't register. They can't compute how this is possibly done. And this happens in everyday life. So I want you to default in these positions. I want you to question things. I want you to question your paradigms, those mental frameworks that you interpret data through, your observations that you make, and you do a little calculation to figure out what, what you can rely on and what you can't. There is so much out there that is perhaps intentionally meant to deceive you. And we don't always question whether people may have a motive to deceive us. And there are, unfortunately, a lot of nefarious incentives out there for people to deceive us. And you want to be aware of these. You want to accept that. And I'm not getting into conspiracy theory and all that kind of stuff, but you want to ask yourself if, you know, don't dismiss, I guess is the way I want to say this. If something in order for an alternative hypothesis for the, it to be true about what's going on, some particular thing that you believe one thing and it's actually something else. If for the other thing to be true, you would have to accept that someone has a motive to intentionally deceive you. That is, many people are telling you one thing and they would have to be lying. That's not always the case. Sometimes they're telling you what they believe to be true and they're deceived as well. And then you go, well, that means there has to be a conspiracy. And, um, you know, people, generally speaking, aren't evil. I agree with that. But there are incentives sometimes for people to deceive. You probably heard yourself in the past say, well, why would they lie? Well, that's a great question. 
Ask yourself that occasionally. Why would somebody lie? What motives would they have? And if you can't come up with any, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that you are being told or everything represented to you, to you is 100% the truth. Remember, sometimes people are deceived. Sometimes people are sharing with you a flawed hypothesis they have. We make assumptions. In fact, that's what makes magic tricks possible are assumptions we make. When you have this incongruity between what you're seeing and what your axioms are, those first principles, those things that you think you know for sure, then trust that. I want you to go with that intuition and start questioning things. Don't just go, well, I must be wrong because I gotta trust what I'm seeing with my eyes. Remember, that's the premise of magic tricks altogether is that your senses are deceiving you. And it often starts with a very small thing. When you see these, uh, these videos about how those secrets are revealed, how those tricks are performed, they're very disappointing because often it's very, you know, subtle deception early on and it's something that's not that big a deal where it's like, oh, well, he did really good diversion there. There was some sort of diversion tactic where the, you know, you know, they, they distract you with this hand and they're doing something with this hand. They're putting the coin in their pocket. I'm giving you, you know, terrible examples, um, but it starts, all these tricks are, they fundamentally have the same thing. And diversion is a big one, is that you are busy paying attention over here and the real thing that reveals the trick, what's going on is over here. The explanation to setting you straight, to revealing the truth is over here, but you're busy, you're distracted. You're looking at the diversion over here. That's one way, the sleight of hand that occurs. And think about that, go back, because these things happen on small stages and we make these assumptions uh, well, I don't mean to say small stages that magicians stand on. I mean to say they happen in small stages. The deceit in real life, when we come to believe things throughout our lives and we accept paradigms that were so far off basis, it usually starts way back in the beginning with a premise that we accepted as true and there might have been sleight of hand. There might have been a distraction, a diversion, and we made one assumption and then we started to you know, that was our foundation. We started to build upon a flawed foundation and now everything's wrong. Once you deceive somebody with a small thing, as long as they hold on to that, you can continue to deceive them in a greater and greater way because they believe they understand a particular premise. That original premise, that original assumption is what takes people aside. And, and uh, I want you to think about like when you were a kid and uh, if you've got kids in the room, then maybe pause this video and just have them removed because I want to talk about some of those, those uh, usually fairly benign lies, <laughs> and they are lies, deceptions that we tell to children. So we get kids to believe in Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, these types of things. And the reason for that, the reason is because you're a trusted source and there might be some pernicious outfall or fallout rather from having a trusted source give you information. But the reason that it works, the reason it's so easy to pull off something like the concept of Santa Claus, which as an adult, you look back and you go, wow, uh, there's a lot of the logic as a child, I must have dismissed a lot of things. And I remember uh, looking back, it comes down to, well, you had a very trusted source. Somebody in a position of authority, usually your parents, were telling you one thing, and then it was perpetuated by other areas of society. You know, your teachers, everybody, your aunts and uncles, everybody upheld this. There was a bit of a conspiracy there, not a bit of one, there's a giant conspiracy to uphold it in the name of good fun. So sometimes these things, again, are for entertainment value, and there are pure motives and we can debate whether or not those things are good for kids or not. I've often wondered psychologically, is there a, a bit of uh, damage done when it's revealed that they were misled by a very trusted source and do they then carry skepticism? And maybe that's a good thing. They carry skepticism going forward that not all, you can't always believe trusted source. And that's what I'm getting at here with these examples is you throughout your life have 
relied on information. You've had faith that somebody in a, a position of trust with you has shared information with you. Therefore it must be true. But then what has happened from there? What, what goes on after that? Do you then start to continue to believe bigger and bigger falsehoods because you're attached to that original premise, which is false. So as I was saying before, when you experience incongruity between those first principles you've come to believe and what you see, I think it is a good idea to question both. Question both ends. Question, what am I seeing? And is this data I can rely upon? And question your first principles and your axioms. Which is more likely false? And we tend to have this confirmation bias where, well, what I believe my whole life can't be false. Therefore, what I'm seeing must be false. Well, okay, good. But question that, go into it, dive into it a little deeper. And this is where I started the whole conversation, which is when I see these illusions, I like to see them revealed. And there's other things in life that when I'm like, huh, this stuff doesn't all add up. There's this incongruity that I'm referring to. And I want to know what, which of the things is flawed. My original paradigm, my first principles, what I come to believe, or is it what I'm observing right now? Is the data that I'm taking in right now being misinterpreted in some way? And then explore that. That's the healthy practice. Following along with blind faith, just because everyone believes something is not a good idea. You want to be the person you want to have the courage to dissent. And what we're talking about today is stepping out of that and realizing, well, I'm going to question this. And I can appreciate there's things in life that, you know, you may be a little afraid to question, but the truth shall set you free. It's always a good thing to pursue the truth and look deeper and deeper and be, you know, sort of check your pride at the door because that may be one of the things where you're like, I would hate to admit that I've been completely wrong in what I've been thinking all this time. And as it comes to management, would you have to admit to your people, to your team? Would it be humiliating, embarrassing? Maybe you do need to embrace a little humility, be humble and admit, boy, I, I thought this all along and I was wrong. I had a flawed paradigm. I've done the research. The key that I'm saying is don't be afraid to do it. Don't believe that just because everybody believes one thing, it must be truth or must be true. The truth is not democratic and the truth does not care about your feelings. It doesn't care about your past. The truth is the truth and pursue it. You will always go closer and closer to the truth as you attempt to do so. That's my belief that the truth will not remain hidden. Now it can be very tricky to get to navigate some of these waters in your investigations, but you will get closer. Some things will, you know, the smoke will lift, the fog will lift and you'll come out of the ether, choose your metaphor, these things. So I really encourage you to question things and go, the more you can have a strong first principle, the, the better your axioms, the, the, the more you can rely on those paradigms, the better, better you're going to be able to discern things. You're going to be a better decision maker and a better, more effective manager. A lot of people swear by their intuition and they're like, you know, trust your gut. And I think there's something really to that. We shouldn't dismiss that. There is something about your first instincts, that intuition is telling you something. Don't forget the gifts of the Holy Spirit among the gifts of the Holy Spirit include knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. There's probably a reason that something just doesn't add up for you and you are skeptical. That can be very healthy. When I think of what makes us vulnerable to this or what makes people successful, being able to pull off a magic trick or a proverbial magic trick in life where, where we are susceptible to being fooled, it comes down to some of the things we've talked about. And I'd like to isolate some of those and point those out so that you can maybe jot those down and or make a mental note of it at minimum. So you can sort of do a little bit of a scorecard when your intuition, when your spidey senses are tingling and something doesn't add up. That first one we already talked about is small assumptions in the beginning. Are you making an assumption? Do you know something for sure? Or are you making an assumption when you realize it's an, an assumption and we've already talked about if that's if, if your foundation is an assumption, you need to go right back to that and say, well, let me find out the facts for sure about this miscommunications, all sorts of problems 
are founded with assumptions. So get rid of the assumptions. The next thing is those small misdirections that somebody may intentionally deceive you with. And did you assume that? Did you accept something? Or is it possible that somebody did a small deception and that you that was at the foundation? I also think it's way worse when it's compound assumptions where we have or compound sleight of hand misdirections. So if we go back to magic, sometimes the trick has two or three primary components to it. It's not usually more than that, but these have a compounding effect. So if you're making more than one assumption, it's just be getting, it's becoming really difficult for you to realize. Like they're really able to pull off huge illusions. And remember, this is a lesson for life. Are there things in your life right now, perhaps that you believe and they're illogical. When you think about them, you go, it doesn't make sense. I can't answer it, but everybody believes this. It might be true. Probably the effect of compound misdirection, compound assumptions. Each one doesn't necessarily beget the other, but when you stack them together, you get way far off. You know, that whole concept, if you're, you know, taking a trip to the moon and you start with your one degree off course at the beginning, how far off are you going to miss? You're going to miss the moon by, I don't know, I can't do the math. I haven't taken the time to do that, but you know, you're missing the moon by perhaps thousands of miles by being very only slightly off at the beginning with the wrong trajectory. And that's the same thing when it comes to these concepts of what we believe and how sometimes people can deceive us is we believe one thing or we start off course just a little bit. And then if we just steer, steer off course a little bit more with a compound assumption or compound multiple misdirections, then we come to these very erroneously con erroneous conclusions. As we continue to list these things, the assumption could be what we talked about before is is your assumption that a trusted source, an authority is to be believed? And it, could it be that that person who shared that piece of information with you that got you believing in something to begin with, they are deceived or may they have a reason, maybe it's well intended, maybe not of sharing information with you. I've often gone back and found out that that person was making assumptions and they were well-meaning when they shared something with me. They wanted to protect me in some way and I questioned and I looked and I wasn't upset with the person for misleading me because they were their instincts for protection of me were to share something that they found out that, you know, may harm me. And then I realized, oh, did you do the, the homework? Did you do the research to find out that that's accurate, that that's true? Or were you making an assumption? So it's not always your own assumption. It could be the source of the information is a trusted source and that might be an assumption. So you know, go through this mental exercise, this little checklist. The next one on the checklist would be confirmation bias. What you're seeing, what you're observing confirms what you already believe. And therefore you want to believe it because it's, there's, it's difficult to let go of something that we believe for a long time. We have a vested interest in being right. Sometimes it's very embarrassing to let go of that to, you know, our peers and everything that like we've really committed to this. People have observed that I've acted in one way based on a premise and we want to believe we hold on to that. So ask yourself, do you have a confirmation bias? Are you there for, you know, living in an echo chamber? You're only considering sources of information that confirm what you already believe. Go outside of that, get some dissension involved and, and take an opposing opinion, uh, take an opposing viewpoint and question, is this possible? Is it, forget about whether it's plausible, is it even possible? If so, and if not, why and why not? Ask yourself that. So make sure that you're not allowing confirmation bias to blind you. Another one is wanting for another reason to believe the lie. Sometimes we want to believe that person is a magic. It's like, wow, that's awesome. He's levitating. And you know, logically we go, you can't levitate. Nobody can levitate, but wouldn't it be cool if somebody really could? And so we want to believe this. And we see this in business where maybe somebody comes out and we get conned, uh, you know, think of a Ponzi scheme or think of some of the big um, uh, frauds that have been perpetrated by people raising money and, misleading investors 
in the uh, corporate world where we want to believe something because if that's true that'd be so good for us so ask yourself when you go through this mental checklist do i want this to be true is that why i'm accepting this in uh, uh in spite of the fact that i have some spidey senses tingling in spite of the fact that this is illogical to me i'm accepting it because i want it to be true for whatever reason ask yourself that another one is is people just ignoring this cognitive dissonance that you have that you experience where you're like i have competing beliefs and they can't both be true so i'll just ignore them i'll ignore that cognitive dissonance and i'll just move on so look at that on do you have complete competing beliefs do you have a dilemma do you have competing premises and what are you doing about that don't allow them because one of them is false you have to figure out what that is and again don't live in denial this is about pride i know it's hard to let go of erroneous beliefs but you know ask yourself why it's hard and those things are usually you know not good for you it, like like i said if it's pride you know, swallow your pride the other one we've already discussed that's on our checklist is following the crowd the whole concept of we can't all be wrong and so we just kind of believe in this truth by democracy thing well that's flawed logic as well have you heard of gaslighting this is a concept where people try to make you feel like you're crazy no you, you you got to be crazy you know what you believe is way out there because everybody else believes this and there's all sorts of ways to gaslight somebody but that's an effective technique is it possible that you're being gaslit in some way just a couple more that i've observed and while i was contemplating this that i came up with and one is the impact of fear on logic and reasoning i guess there's good psychological evidence out there that a person who is afraid doesn't use the same parts of his brain that he otherwise would to do abstract reasoning and very logical thinking so are you in a state of fear and then you're therefore using that sympathetic nervous system that fight or flight where you know you you are going and you're kind of uh, being more reactive instead of using some more critical thinking and going back and logically looking at something is fear causing you to psychologically be distracted from learning the truth think about that we just know that those who are living in a state of fear are not using logic the way they ordinarily would and they are not using sound reasoning to try to get through the situation so ask yourself is that a possibility uh, one other one is this concept I've alluded to earlier in this conversation, and that is the work that it would take to try to logically go through something. Is it easier? Is it that, you know, somebody's keeping you confused? There's so much data coming at you that it's like, well, I just got to believe the expert. I got to believe the person in authority or whatever. And it would take so much time and effort to go in. You have to ask yourself, what's at stake here? You know, if it's if we're talking about a magic trick, it's like it's 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 fun to just sort of accept. All right, fine. You know, I I know that it's not uh, uh, what I'm seeing there, but it's entertainment. But if what's at stake is decisions that may affect your business, your career, your livelihood, your investment, your family's well-being. These types of things don't allow a state of confusion and a whole bunch of data to, you know, lead you astray from doing the right thing, which is you owe it to yourself to do an investigation and to take some opposing positions and test, give them the litmus test, give them the sniff test and find out, you know, if something doesn't add up, why is that? Have you heard this term, the long con? This is where somebody is going to con you they are going to trick you they're going to deceive you they're going to commit fraud upon you but it's for a large amount and a big con the long con requires a lot of preparation and so there are a lot of things looking back there's a great movie about this and hopefully i didn't spoil it by anything i said up to this point um, but it's called matchstick men with uh nicholas cage watch that if you want to uh 
explore the, the concept of the long con. These guys are con men in the movie, obviously. And, you know, it takes a lot of preparation. If there's something that's really big, that's another sort of false premise to go, well, this is huge, therefore it can't be false. I mean, this is global. This is everybody in the organization accepts it. This comes back to that whole democratic concept of truth. It's like, no, sometimes the long con, there is a possibility that you are being deceived and there's been a lot of preparation that goes into this. If we think back to the concept of magic tricks, maybe, you know, a person who is pulling off a, one that you've never seen before is introducing something novel but it took a lot of preparation the idea is that this didn't happen overnight i heard something recently that i didn't know and that was are you familiar with the patriot patriot act this is the act that was passed by the senate and congress in the united states following 9 11. i heard i found this out from dr ron paul that that was already written prior to the towers going down, prior to any terrorist attack, the Patriot Act was written. It just wasn't called that. It was called something else and they wanted to push that through, but it wasn't. So they waited for the right crisis situation after the terrible tragedy of 9-11 and the terrorist attacks. Now something can be pushed through because people are in a state of fear. They're not acting logically. They're not asking everything and there's a huge bill with a lot of information in it that you know may be temporary and it sounds good for now and probably most people involved are well intended at that point. Some people do have ulterior motives though and it gets pushed through and then we're stuck with that to this day or at least if you're American, you're stuck with uh, a lot of uh, the fallout from that decision of Im implementing that to this day and a lot of people would criticize the constitutionality of that document so you know the long con a lot of preparation the reason i thought of that was that just blew my mind you mean before the the terrorist attack even happened they wrote this they just gave it a good name for marketing the patriot act are you a patriot yes or no you'll vote for this if you're a patriot anyone opposed to this can't possibly be a patriot ask yourself those questions because sometimes the patriotic thing in that would be to absolutely reject that. I wonder if I'm sort of evolving in my tastes over time and that's why I'm so interested in how the magician tricks are revealed as opposed to the magic itself. I do enjoy the magic itself and I appreciate that and I'm like wow you know that's that guy's really good. He's got some skills there he's clearly talented and i've watched a lot of this stuff on netflix and the various specials and everything but i'm i'm more interested in the truth right now in fact i mentioned that david blaine is my favorite illusionist magicians but he's taken to more endurance um stunts i don't know what you'd call them but the way he's entertaining is becoming less and less about deception in terms of the um you know, the um, typical magic trick, typical illusion. And he started doing things that require him, like I say, endurance stunts that require him to do a whole bunch of training to be able to do something. And then he sort of combined those to be able to do things where it like looks, there's that that, con that um, thing where he puts the, the, I don't know what it is, like almost like a knitting needle, a very long needle. Uh, you know, it's not as thick as an ice pick, but all the way through his arm and he's got Ricky Gervais sitting there and uh, Ricky Gervais makes the comment that it's great either way. Either it's an illusion and it's incredible or you're doing it for real, which means you're crazy and that's incredible as well. And he does the things where he can regurgitate frogs or make frogs appear out of his mouth, live frogs and this kind of thing. Well, we know that he's actually doing those things and catching a bullet in his, uh, teeth and all that kind of stuff. There are ways to do this by illusion. And then there are ways to do this by incredible training. And there's another way to do it. There's, there's multiple explanations. It's always interesting to see this, but maybe that's why he's my favorite is that he's, he's turning to actually be more transparent about what he's doing, but he's pulling off things that others can't pull off uh, because they require, it's easier to trick somebody than to do it legitimately. I, I think of that, quote at the beginning of the movie, The Big Short. 
and uh, it's attributed to Mark Twain, but my research had me uh, discover that it isn't necessary. It's not likely that Mark Twain actually said or wrote that. It's probably somebody else. But the quote is good either way. It said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So ask yourself, what is it that you think you know for sure that just ain't so? And I think that's where we should leave it. I hope you got something out of this and that you will challenge your premises. And if you believe something that's going on right now in your life, in your business, in the world, and it just doesn't register as necessarily true, or maybe it does register as true, but you are in debates with others over the validity of the concept. Ask yourself, it's okay. Go and ask yourself and do a little bit of research and enter that humble space where you say, oh, it's possible I'm wrong. I, I would like to know the truth. I think we should all want to know the truth and we've got to be good with one another. We've got to be good to one another and accept dissension and that people disagree with us and that's okay. And speaking of disagreeing with me, if you completely disagree with some of the concepts I've gone through today, then leave a comment because when you leave a comment and someone in the community reads that, we learn and we need to learn from one another. Perpetual refinement. <laughs>